and welcome to another watch list, my weekly rundown of what I'm watching and what I've been up to. Five more films this week, two from Britain, three from Asia. And let's start with our first Asian movie, which is the January release of Arrow Video's JSA. JSA, which is a Park Chan-wook film that tells the story of the interface between North and South Korea. Uh, we patrols on one side from the South Korea side, we have patrols on the North Korean side, both very untrusting, that it is a very untrusting society and very suspicious of each other. But somehow through an incident or people getting lost, etc., the two sets or two sets of the people that are involved in the border patrols, especially at night, uh, get the mix. They start to build relationships and friendships, except something goes wrong and there's a death. Now we are not shown what happens at that time and in what is a bit of a Rashomon thing, the story gets told by multiple people, it gets told by multiple versions and we get the thing slowly released to us over the course of the film as to what actually happened, both in terms of how those relationships got to that stage, whether they were relationships or whether it was all part of some ploy. And it's very kind of twisty turny as people are brought in to investigate the crime, to some sort of satisfaction and how that all plays out. Now, it's a film that's beautifully made. I don't think there's any getting away from that part. There's no octopus in it. No, there's not. But it looks at this relationship between the North and South, but is a contentious relationship uh, at the best of times. And like I say, beautifully made film that, that kind of when you watch it, at least the first time that you watch it, kind of feels like there's something missing from it. I can see why people would love it or I can see why people would be disappointed by JSA because it is not quite as tight as maybe some of his later, later work uh, was, you know, when maybe the big reveal doesn't build up, he doesn't build up to a big enough crescendo with it to kind of to kind of show it. But yeah, a really interesting release and, you know, this this release from uh, from Arrow is absolutely stacked. There's lots of content to dive into, of which I have not seen the half of, but I will do because GSA is a really interesting watch and a really interesting release and one that you probably should uh, get stuck into. Next up is a film that's in a series uh, that I really quite enjoy. If you think Park Chan-wook is a really odd filmmaker, makes really interesting or odd films, you ain't seen nothing compared to this. This is the bed sitting room. And it's number one in the BFI Flipside release. And I'll be honest enough to say to you that this was my second time trying to watch this. Because the first time I sat down to try and watch it, I was just... It was one of those, I think I was trying to multitask at the time. And I was trying to look something on my phone while starting to watch the film. And after about 20-25 minutes, I was like, what the hell is this film? This is about as absurd as you'll ever see. We are in a post-apocalyptic world where, you know, the world's gone to hell. And we have a lot of these great British comedic actors that you may know and recognise if you're of a certain vintage like myself. Spike Milligan, Arthur Lowe's in it, Sir Peter Cook's in it. You know, you get, you get the idea. And <laughs> it's a really hard film to describe because, like, I'll give you an example. One of the characters, they all kind of have ideals. There's a man and woman there, they want to get somewhere sa safe. There's some people want a relationship. But there's one of the characters wants to be a bed sitting room. And he becomes a bed sitting room in the story. It's completely absurd. It's completely barmy. And I kind of love it. I kind of think in some ways it's hilarious in bits. You know, there's a sequence where somebody wants... Somebody wants a relationship to feel more like a relationship. So he, he he basically says, no, I want you to treat me like you would a real man kind of thing. And she starts throwing plates at him and trying to get him to go. And he says, yeah, more, more, more. Do that. And some sort of play on the husband and wife relationship or hate-hate relationship. Like, it, it's very hard to describe other than to say it's just absurd comedy. But it's well-made absurd comedy. Like I say, it's funny throughout. You've got these incredible comedic actors that go the whole way through it. Um, and there's a lot of real talent on screen here. I mean, Richard Lester was kind of 
in the heyday of success he'd made Hard Day's Night he, he, people were saying well what do you want to do next and he thought let's do this this was written, written by uh, Spike and Peter Cook it seems um, and he said you know let's, let's make this this is great and of course when it was released I don't think it was particularly well received because it doesn't make an awful lot of sense it isn't the kind of tight narrative piece that maybe people were expecting but has been released by BFI Flipside. Here is this kind of peculiarity or oddity. I mean, I've made a couple of, I've made one video, sorry, about um, BFI Flipside releases before, which is Jerry O'Hara ones. I'll try and link that down in the description. But uh, the bed sitting room sits really nicely in this collection because it doesn't kind of fit in any other collection. I don't think it would fit well in like a Criterion collection or otherwise, but it's perfectly here and one that I'm really glad that I watched and I have to say I went from I don't really like that film from the first 20 minute watch to going down sitting down looking at it again and going I really like that I like the booklet I love the interviews with Peter Cook I love the interviews with Spike Milligan I like the interviews with Richard Lester on the disc as well it's amazing loved it but maybe not for everybody I don't know it was for me next one up is another Eureka Classics release and this one is again quite recent, and it's Encounters of a Spooky Kind with Samo Hung there. And it's one of these releases that, that people were very excited for when it was announced. Uh, it seems to have a lot of love and fervour around it. It spawned a sequel, I think, but this was the special Blu ray edition released by. Eureka. It kind of introduced this kind of comedy, spooky genre that became quite prevalent. Like Mr. Vampire came out last year, I think, from Eureka, and it kind of you can see an awful lot of three lines from that, from the this film to that, and it basically tells the story of Samo Hung, is a kind of I'd say downtrodden character. He has a relationship with his wife, but it's quite clear his wife's cheating on him. And I mean, this story basically tells the story of how the lover tries to off. Samo Hung by virtue of using spooky or ghost mythology to do it. Uh, even though there are a couple of instances where, you know, things spookily or supernaturally happen that can't be explained that results in some disturbing kind of deaths, if I'm, if I'm quite honest. But what this film has that actually, in a lot of films that subsequently followed this, that I don't see an awful lot of. This this is genuinely funny. I, I laughed quite a bit through this. I mean, if nothing else, if people didn't laugh, they're going to smile their way through it. Sam Hung is very engaging in this. He's very innocent. He's very sweet. You know, it's it's that kind of thing of he's been set up to fail, but nearly by virtue of luck or bad luck from one side, he managed to escape and go through. So, uh, you know, entertaining the whole way through. I very much enjoyed it. And I, I, if you like this type of film where you want you want an entry point to get in to these kind of releases for your classics this is a good one to go for because like i say it's a very easy watch it's comedic and it's it's you know kind of easy watching like i say so yeah and kind of spooky kind good release for me and uh yeah the only thing that i don't like you can see the spines these are a bit thicker and they're a bit thicker because they put the poster on the outside maybe because of sizing to go in it but you get this kind of poster it sets the thicken out the cases maybe i'm just crazy because you know i'm running the shelf space just like everybody else and the last thing i need is for cases to be thicker but pretty all the same next one up is i think very clearly the best film in the bunch and this one is from uh the one of the horror one of the hammer horror uh box sets from indicator and that is the third one, which is uh, Blood and Terror, which is here, which has, I have to say, as a box set, this is, this is pretty different from the Hammer box sets that came before it. It has a number of films, Camp Blood Island, Strangers of Bombay, and The Terror of the Tongs. And certainly the first two, Camp and Blood Island has is, is been as talked about in here, is a very controversial film. It kind of showed Japanese prisoner of war camps and showed kind of the horrific side of Japanese prisoner of war camps, etc. And it was deeply criticised at the time. And so they took another run at it and they put it in the hands of Al Guest and tried to tell a story of, of, of servicemen in Burma who were separated. People were very scattered in the British Army. People were very secluded and about them trying to make their way back to safety. And they happen upon a village where they are 
ambushed. Uh, but they manage to survive the ambush and within the ambush they find plans or covert plans which they can't decipher and it's about trying to find out what is in those plans and then how to use it or how to get those plans to somebody who could use it the radio was broken etc and they're a troop I've been talking for ages and the film is yesterday's enemy so like I say separated from everywhere else and they get through and the you know, it tells the story. Now, Stanley Baker is, is the man in charge here. Uh, there's many other characters. There's a war reporter there played by Leo McKern. There's a padre, a father, a holy man played by Guy Rolfe, uh, who's excellent in it. Um, and we've got this ensemble cast, and then these, you know, the Japanese cast that are in, in there as well. And I, I think this film is terrific absolutely terrific i see some of the, the criticisms about it in that they people criticized it for the way it was shot that it was very clearly shot in the studio i don't i would have honestly believed that this this was shot kind of on location somewhere in the jungle i think it's helped by the fact it's in black and white don't get me wrong but it's these sets etc i think feel very realistic i uh, you know I, I think it's one of the great strengths is the believability of everything that's happening in there i think it's almost i mean it's not almost certainly it is the highlight of this entire set it's a, like i said it's an absolutely brilliant brilliant film that tells the story of a lot of the difficult decisions that had to be made to for the greater good some which maybe weren't so good or successful or other ones that you know maybe didn't work out and morally questionable but those are the complexities of of trying to survive and war did people do the right thing is there greater good is there any reason to do things for a greater good does that justify it i think it's the best role i've ever seen stanley baker in for instance uh, find him a bit hit and miss sometimes you know things like um eve I think he's the weakest part of Eve, the Juice of Lose Eve film, etc. as well. But I think Yesterday's Enemy is absolutely terrific. And kind of sits very nicely within this box set. Because some of the films around it are enjoyable. Like Strangers of Bombay is enjoyable. But not quite as narratively strong. Camp of Blood Island is leaning too much to be a political film, if you ask me. Rather than anything else. So, you know, really interesting box set. Like the extras that run, they, they, you get a retrospective documentary on each single one of these releases sometimes 15 minutes long sometimes 20 minutes long whatever where people like jonathan rigby talk about the you know the effect that it had in the film who was involved and the people that were involved i love that stuff absolutely love it you've got the women of horror, horror women of hammer feature that's in all every single one of these releases so it takes a female member of the cast and highlights them about what they did before in their career and afterwards uh, uh, there's just so much good stuff that's in these hammer box sets that We've had six not that long ago. I hear sevens in production. I, long may they continue. The job that Indicator doing these just makes it all so worthwhile to look at. And that brings me to the last release this week. And it's another uh, Eureka Classics release. You can see I picked up all of these. I think they're great. I will continue to pick them up. I've really enjoyed them. They're great for me to stick on in a Saturday afternoon, Sunday. This one's One Arm Boxer with Jimmy Wang. Or Jimmy Wang Yu. And it tells the story of, well, it's a classic, you know, trope of Asian cinema. We have bad guys, good guys. We have the kind of martial arts schools, competing martial arts schools. One's good, one's bad. Uh, one here gets involved in dealing illicit goods, let's just say. And uh, their opposition basically is the other martial arts school. And they want the overthrown basically kill one martial arts girl so they can basically do what they want and um jimmy wang Yu's character is like the star pupil of one side of it uh, and he basically tries to foil the other side as much as he can and complicating these things is the old uh, the head of the other school hires these basically assassins so because this is what you do in movies. You've got one from each kind of branch of martial arts. So you've got a yoga master, you've got a judo master, you've got a karate. You get the idea. And they're all terrifying characters. And in doing so, one of the terrifying characters, spoiler, gets Jimmy Wang Yu's arm chopped off. 
And rather than just that being the end of the film, uh, he goes to retrain him, becomes the best version that he can of himself with kind of Rocky style. Let's use our disadvantages to our advantage and win the day. Now, it's a pretty simple premise. One's been told before, but again, one I really, really enjoyed making my through that this was... This was incredibly easy to watch, you know, to root for something. I mean, it's ridiculous, don't get me wrong, but it kind of plays out and works well. It has the classic scenes. We have fights in tea houses. God, is it an Asian Kung Fu movie without a fight at tea house? Um, and this one's fairly early on. This one's from 1971. So if I consider like Dragon Inn or something was a few years previous, so King Hu, uh, you can see how this fits right alongside there, you know, Tibet monks. A lot of the things became staples of the of the genre going forward. So worth saying, this, just like many other of these releases that you have been putting out of these concrete films, etc., are eminently watchable. Really good fun. I mean, they do all get a bit similar each after a while of similar themes and similar plots, but I think that's part of the charm of them. You know, it's just how they execute on that and whether there's good fun to be had along with that. And that is my watch list for this week. If you've seen any of the movies, as usual, let me know down in the comments. And if you've made it this far, thank you very much for watching. I'll catch you next time. See you then.